Well, looks like it's my turn. What's going on, people? It's your boy, Aster, back in the house. I know I didn't finish uploading my UPA content. I didn't promise that I would, though, so that's on you guys for believing that I would if anybody thought that I would upload the rest of that season. But that's not what we're here for today. Today, we are here for DPL content. Right, you guys don't know what the DPL is, or at least most of you don't. If you've been subscribed to me for a while, uh, you've probably not watched any videos of mine in quite a while because I haven't been uploading much, but you also probably haven't been keeping up with a lot of the Draft League community, and neither have I. Despite having played a lot of games in Sword and Shield Draft, I haven't really been part of the larger spectrum of the community like I used to be back in 2017 and 2018, but that doesn't mean that I can't get back into it. Now, if you don't know what the DPL is, our good pal, Gregulator60, Greg, who we've known for a long time, long time acquaintance, friend of the channel, created basically a Smogon Premier League for Draft. And it's garnered such a good reputation over the past couple of years that even great Smogon players like Finchinator and TDK have joined. So if you don't know how the SPL, the Smogon Premier League works, it's basically a bunch of different teams with captains drafting players across the Smogon community. They send in different players to play different metagames each week, and of course this comes at a cost. When you draft a player, you have to pay for them, and other teams can auction for them if they feel that they are a valuable asset to their team. The DPL works in the exact same way. So not only are we drafting teams of Pokemon, but before that happens, we are drafting players. Now, I am not a team captain. I got drafted to a team, and I got drafted to the team that I most wanted to be on, Mount Rushmore. If you guys don't know who Mount Rushmore are, I've talked about these guys incessantly over the years. We have Gypsy King, Zazo, Aki, and Maddie. Zazo and Maddie are captaining the team, and their first two draft picks auctioned players were Gypsy and Aki. These four players make up Mount Rushmore, who are long time regarded to be four of the best, if not the absolute best draft league players in all of Pokemon Draft League. So Gypsy and Aki went first, and then they picked up Carson, and I was their fourth pick overall, which was great. Really felt good about that. However, I got picked up for 5.5k on a budget of 120,000. Now, this might sound pretty good to you, of course, like some teams bid for me, but no, the minimum bid for a player is 5,000. So, I felt a little bit disrespected, I'm not gonna lie, I consider myself to be a pretty good draft player. So, why did I go for 5.5k? Honestly, I don't care. That just means that our team is going to be stronger overall because we got really good players for a very, very low cost. Gypsy King, of course, didn't come at a cheap cost. It cost 45,000 out of the 120,000 budget. So that was a huge blow, but we were able to get a bunch of other players to really round out the team and make a strong core of players to play across three different metagames. Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, and of course, the latest generation, Sword and Shield. Now this video is gonna be about our week one battles. I'm going to show you guys my battle as I was put into the starting lineup. We have to win four matches out of seven to win the week. The kills per game don't matter. The score at the end of the week how many wins you got out of seven does. This week we are against the Florida men and their captain core is actually pretty strong. Draw 15 and Kaz. Both of these players are very good draft league players and I'm pretty sure I've run into draw quite a few times on the showdown OU ladder and I average about 1700 rating, if not a little bit higher. It's a little lower than usual this gen, but that just gives you an idea of how good they are. And the rest of the team, the players that they auctioned for, are pretty good as well. One of their top picks is Jacko, and if you don't know Jacko, he was regarded as one of the strongest players in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Didn't make the top 30 list that I made with Jolt back in the day, but that's only because Jacko doesn't upload, otherwise he would have definitely been there. I would argue that he would have probably made top 10. So we know that they have a very strong team, but I have a lot of confidence in our team. So you know what, let's hop into these games. I'll show you guys what happened. We're gonna go through all seven games, and you guys can skip ahead to whichever ones you want to see. I would highly recommend checking out mine, of course, since you're on this channel, Gypsies and Maddies, as well as Harris's. 
All of these games were really, really close and really good games. So definitely check those out. But without further ado, I've spoken enough. Let's hop into the first game. Let's check it out. For this first match, we have Glop against X-Ray. Glop, uh, not a guy that I'm too familiar with. I had the chance to talk to him quite a bit in call over the course of the week as we were preparing for these matches. Seemed like a very competent player and uh, we gave him a pretty solid team. This is a Oras game, so Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire. So we send in one of our squads that we drafted against one of theirs. So you guys may be wondering, are we going to get like team builders for this stuff or are we going to like go over full sets throughout the battles. The answer is no, because there is a very high chance that we can run into any of these teams again come playoffs. There are only eight squads and four make playoffs. So essentially, if we make playoffs, three out of the seven that we've played are going to be there and we're going to have to have some sort of rematches. It may not be the same teams facing each other because you only send in, for example, in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, you have three teams. You only send in two for that week. So we might not run into the same matchups, but we do not want to chance that. So I'm going to try to reveal as little as possible about these teams in these games. I'm only going to re really reveal what was shown, except for maybe mine. I might go into a little bit more detail, but we shall see. So let's start off this game. Glop has a really cool squad here. He's got a Scarf Rose Raid to handle the Manaphy. Leads off with it against the Ferrothorn, uh, Ferrothorn and is going to immediately switch out into Zapdos as the Pharaoh gets up rocks. Zapdos is going to proceed to defog them away as it gets toxic. So it's on a timer, of course. It's Rocky Helmet, which is pretty good for that Gallade on the other side. It is a Mega Gallade, of course. The Registeel switches in as Zapdos doubles in. And our Registeel gets up a sub, and it's actually sub Focus Punch, so this is really good for dealing with the Ferrothorn. We're going to be able to get off a massive amount of damage here, and I just want to pause real quick here. There's no way that X-Ray is staying in this turn with the Ferrothorn. We could argue that, okay, he might go for, I don't know, Bulldoze. This is Gen 6, right? So Ferrothorn doesn't have as many options as it does in Gen 8. For example, it doesn't have Body Press, so it can't really deal with Registeel all that well once it's behind a sub. So it could be argued that you might want to click a move other than Focus Punch here, knowing that X-Ray is going to see it coming now that it's hit him once. However, Glop is going to proceed to click Focus Punch again as the Crobat switches in. Now, the problem with Crobat is that it is Infiltrator. <laughs> so uh, it's going to be able to go through the sub and it does have Super Fang to whittle down the Registeel. Luckily, we have Ice Punch. Unfortunately, it doesn't do too much. And of course, Roost cancels the super effective nature of the Ice Punch. So it's only going to be taking 22 every time it roosts. It can very easily go for Super Fang, so long as it doesn't get crit or frozen, of course, uh, the Crobat is fine. So right here, we argued that this Registeel had pretty much done its job. It had caught the Ferrothorn off guard and weakened it, put it into range of stuff like Mega Alakazam and Keldeo and all that jazz and even Crocodile. If it came in on hazards, it would probably die to Earthquake at that point. So it was very possible for Glop to switch out here. However, he stays in multiple turns after, as you guys will see, continuing to Ice Punch and getting whittled by the Super Fang. So the Registeel isn't really making forward progress here. The Crobat's staying relatively healthy. Now, finally, Glop's going to switch out into Crocodile on the Roost that he knows is coming. And I think he proceeds to get up rocks, if I'm not mistaken. No, he goes for a knockoff. And this is Dread Plate. That I can reveal uh, because I'm pretty sure that they calced it. And they saw that it was Dread Plate, so Ferrothorn is knocked out, but now Manaphy's in. Dangerous Pokemon, obviously. And uh, Crocodile is going to switch out. Roserade is going to come in. It is Choice Scarf. Switches in on Surf just fine. And now the Zapdos is going to come in on a Sleep Powder, which we had teched on, which was really good. So now that Zapdos is asleep, makes things a little bit easier for Keldeo, uh, as well as Registeel if it ever comes back into the game. And this Roserade can get off Sludge Bombs without having to worry about Zapdos uh, going for Hidden Power Ice or, or Roosting on it, etc, etc, et right? So the Roserade is going to switch out into Crocodile. Zapdos burns a turn of sleep here, and Crook is going to proceed to knock off the Zapdos. There's no static. We don't have to fear that this gen, so that's great. Uh, Taunt keeps the Zapdos from Roosting on the following turn, and now Glop is going to get a Brock, so he's pretty much exhausted all of his, uh, his moves except for Earthquake on that Zapdos. So uh, now the... Uh, Gallade is going to come in, and uh, Glop actually stays in. Uh, this is very important to remember that in Oras, the speed does not apply to Mega Evolved Pokemon until the turn after they Mega Evolve. So right now, this thing is still 284 on this turn, max. 
uh, and Crook can outspeed it, of course. So it goes for the Dreadplate knockoff. Uh, Earthquake was slightly better there. Zapdos was switching in on rocks anyway and were faster. Uh, and the Gallade would take more damage from Earthquake. So I'm not 100% sure as to why Glock clicked knockoff here as opposed to Earthquake. But regardless, it wouldn't have killed the Gallade, so it didn't really matter. Uh, now right here, of course, Registeel is going to go down to this Gallade. Glop is going to sack it. Drain Punch comes out, so that's going to put Gallade slightly out of range of Roserade, unfortunately. However, Glop is still going to go into Roserade here. And you guys can't see this on the right, but Glop is under severe timer pressure. So timer is on for these games. They're very serious games. And he's got 10 seconds left. So he goes into Roserade and he gets crit with Shadow Sneak. At the time of the game, we thought that this was actually a roll in our favor. Zazzo confirmed to me that this was a roll in their favor. Regardless, it was a roll. So getting a crit there is pretty significant. Crit chances are a little bit higher in Oras, but still that hurts like crazy because now we're essentially going to have to go with Zapdos and lose it here, which is huge because if that Crocodile in the back is Scarfed, we lose our ground immunity for the rest of the game, so that's horrible. The Gallade is going to safeguard, I'm guessing expecting either Thunder Wave or something of that sort, but uh, gonna safeguard, prevents it from getting status here, which is nice, it's like Misty Terrain. Uh, we're gonna get off a Discharge, we're gonna knock out the Gallade after the Rocky Helmet damage, but unfortunately Zapdos falls to 20%, and there are no boots here, <laughs> guys. This is Rocky Helmet. This thing is essentially dead. All that X-Ray has to do is go into a Mon that's faster to make sure to knock it out. Goes for the knockoff, knocks out the Zapdos, takes a little bit of Rocky Helmet Chip. But now uh, Keldeo is going to come in. It is going to go for, I believe, a Scald here on this turn, if I'm not mistaken. Hydro Pump misses, unfortunately. Doesn't matter because we follow up with Scald. And we are Life Orb. So right here, this is very important. We fall to 85, all right? So... When Keldeo switches in, it falls to 79 on rocks. It takes a life orb hit, it falls to 69. So that's a very important number, not just because it's a, it's a sexy number, but it's a very important number. So right here, uh, the Crobat is going to come in. Glop is going to switch out into Crocodile on, I believe, the Brave Bird. I think it crits here. Uh, I don't think this mattered. I think it was still a two-hit KO regardless, and we're not Scarfed, so that doesn't matter. And now Mega Alakazam is going to come in, and as we mentioned before, speed does not apply on the first turn of Mega Evolution, so Glop actually has to protect here to make sure that he doesn't take a massive amount of damage from Brave Bird. And now we're going to go for Psychic, so knock out the Crobat, that's great, the Manaphy comes in, and this is pretty important here. So, no matter what, Keldeo lives Crocodile's Earthquake. Max attack, Jolly, it, it doesn't kill. And I'm pretty sure at this point we knew that the Crook was Jolly. Uh, it does a max of, I believe, 60 to Keldeo. And I think Adamant does a max of 66, something around that. Uh, and as we mentioned before, even if Keldeo switches in on rocks and takes one life orb hit, it will not die to Crook. So the best play here is to allow Mega Zam to die so long as Manaphy does not get a speed boost. And the only way in this gen for Manaphy to do that is with a Salak Berry or a Custap Berry if it happens to live into the turn where it has 25% or less. So here, Glop had the option to click Protect and did not. Instead, Glop clicked Energy Ball, which puts Manaphy into Salak Berry. So this sucks because now the Manaphy gets off a hit on Keldeo even if we let uh, Zam die. And of course, we're risking the Manaphy going for multiple Calm Mines or a Tail Glow. We can't not kill it. So you could argue that uh, Protect and as you see here, Manaphy goes for Substitute. So you make the argument that Manaphy would have subbed and then we would have had to hit it uh, and break, broken its sub anyway. It could have just subbed a bunch of times to make sure that the endgame was secured. But no, we traced Infiltrator. And unfortunately, because Glop was so low on time, he I think he missed that. So, of course, a set like this, Sub Salic, was probably not the most common, but this is the kind of stuff that you, you gotta kinda see coming. You gotta do multiple mocks for to see something like this. Uh, Manaphy wants to get its speed up against this kind of team because there's a the potential of a Scarfed Roserade, Scarf Crook, even Scarf Zapdos, and the fastest mons on the team, Keldeo, 
and Mega Zam, it doesn't naturally outspeed. So you can make an argument for the fact that Manaphy would run some way to boost its speed at least once, if not keep its speed boost. So it's definitely a play we could have made. If it would have gone for sub and we would have gone for energy ball on the following turn, we would have knocked out Manaphy and our Zam is EV to live anything. It's EV to live that earthquake from Crook. So we would have knocked that out with an energy ball as well. So this sucks because now the Manaphy is plus one speed and is going to go for a Surf into a Psychic on the Keldeo, which of course we needed to keep alive for the Crook specifically. And uh, Psychic is going to knock us out. But no matter what, so long as the Crook got a Moxie boost from knocking out either Zam or Keldeo, it auto won. So this was unavoidable. Goes for Crunch. And there we go. That's going to be a, a KO on Keldeo after the Psychic damage from Manaphy. And of course... Zam is going to go down. So, very unfortunate. We lose game one. So, it's pretty bad. We're down 1-0 already. And we got to win some games. So, let's hop into the next game and let's see what happens. So, I actually got through like four or five of the games until I realized that my cam stopped working. So, now I'm going to have to re-record them all. But it's okay. We're going to get through this. So, this is Sword and Shield. We have Carson against the aforementioned Jacko, obviously one of their strongest players on their team. So, Carson has to do a lot of work here, but he has a really cool team. I mocked him for this game, and this team is so sick, and you guys are about to see it. So, we're going to try to get this through this really quickly so that I can start editing this video. Let's go. Game two, we are now down 1-0, and we got to pull it back. So, Carson opens keys against Lando and actually goes for a light screen. Sick play, knowing that Lando would fear going for Earthquake because of the threat of Magnet Rise. Heat Ren switches in, doubles out into Coco as Carson switches into the Incineroar and goes for Nasty Plot. So, sick play. Uh, you're going to see this Incineroar is absolutely wild. Goes for Scorching Sands on the Drapion and uh, it is Shuka, so it does live. And now Carson's going to go out into keys on the next Earthquake and uh, going to follow it up with a Reflect and let the Clef Key die to knock off. So screens are up for a few more turns and Carson proceeds to go into Nihiligo and is going to go for Substitute. Now something that he saw in a lot of mocks from us, the whole team, was that there was almost always an Assault Vestmon. Slowbro is the Assault Vestmon. So he goes for knockoff and gets rid of it knowing that Psychic from Slowbro actually does not break the sub because of the screen. Follows it up with Power Herb Meteor Beam, increasing its special attack and bringing Slowbro down to 22%. Attempts to go for another sub because in case Jacko switches out, uh, that would be pretty much a free sweep almost from Nihiligo, but doesn't manage to stay behind a sub. Goes for Power Gem, knocks out the Slowbro, does the same to the Heat Ran, hits it for 37 and dies to the subsequent Earth Power. Now Incineroar is going to come out and threatens Scorching Sands, knowing that it's faster than the Heat Ran. Actually gets its Adrenaline Orb activated, which is something that I did in our mock, and uh, pretty much cost me the entire game, because I could have easily knocked out the Incineroar from the range that I got it down to with Kirim's Earth Power. But he's going to Nasty Plot here once again, and fire off a Fire Blast, knocking out the Drapion, and for some reason, Jacko switched out Landorus just to bring it back in. Jacko's very low on time now and gets crit by the next Fire Blast. That definitely mattered. However, I don't know if Incineroar died to the Earthquake. But now Jacko has to go into his Kirim just to get off damage on this Incineroar to put it in range of Coco. Has to take a Fire Blast in the process, followed by an Earth Power, and we are now up 4-2 to two in this game. And it's looking pretty easy to close out. Now all Carson has to do is let the Incineroar die, bring in the Zara Aura, Calm Mine. Zara Aura with my name, by the way, very nice. Goes for Calm Mine, Dazzling Link crits, but the next one will not kill because it's on plus one Spadef. Thunderbolts the Coco for a two hit KO in terrain. Thunderbolts again. And then the Heat Ran's gonna come in and protect. And Carson just has to click one move. Thunderbolt doesn't even have to risk the Focus Blast. Just has to get their Heat Ran into range of close combat from Halucha. Does so with a crit, but the crit did not matter. Halucha is going to come in and it's going to clean up the Heat Ran with the nice close combat. So we go back up to 1-1. One and one. So great. We're back on even ground with the Florida Men. 
and now we proceed into game three. Now this game's a doozy, and you guys, uh, by the end of it, you'll realize why. We got Aki VGC against Zugubu Royale. Uh, I don't know who this guy is. This is my first time hearing about him. Uh, I'm a pretty old fart in this community, and there's a lot of new players, but uh, I think I've heard mention of him from time to time. Aki had a very good game plan for this match. Uh, he had very good plays laid out as well. And in every mock, Aki almost always secured the win with Suicune. So let's see if that can happen again. Opens with Tornadus against Melmetal. This is obviously another Sword and Shield game. As you can see, there is a Melmetal on the other side. Goes for U-Turn into Ferrothorn, and this Ferrothorn is Rocky Helmet. He's going to go for the Leech Seed on the Melmetal's superpower. Uh, it takes Rocky Helmet and Iron Barbs, gets Leech Seeded, brought down to about 55%. And the Ferrothorn, I believe, here switches out into Rotom Heat, catching the Cinderace on the switch. Crocodile is going to follow in, and Aki makes a nice play of going for a Toxic. So is going to able is going to be able to status the Crocodile, which then Stone Edges and Overheat fails to kill the Crocodile, and uh, it's left at twelve percent. They're both pretty low, and they both switch out. Ferrothorn comes back in on the Cinderace, and now switches into Suicune. As the Cinderace goes for a Pyro Ball, gets off 17%, and reveals not to be choiced in any way by switching out, never mind. Silvali Electric comes in. We expected some variant of Silvali. Uh, Silvali Electric made the most sense as it checks Torn very well. Goes for the Parting Shot after getting Scalded and not burned. Torn comes in, and the Ferrothorn is going to explode on the Nasty Plot. A very good play from Aki. He brought uh, Explosion specifically because Torn was likely to run Nasty Plot. Now goes into Terrakion, which is Scarfed and makes a play that he had made in multiple mocks. He expected the Slowbro to switch in as a first-time response to the Scarf Terrakion. The Tornadus has no business staying in here, except it does stay in and goes for Hurricane and knocks out the Rotom, I guess. Zagubu had also seen that in mocks. Uh, it is Life Orb torn as well, as we saw, and uh, now the Terrakion goes for a Stone Edge on Slowbro, and Aki decides to stay in and go for another Stone Edge, had the option of either Torn or uh, Suicune on the Switch, but instead gets the Terrakion burned, unfortunately. And now the Suicune is going to have to switch in on another Scald and also get burned. However, the Suicune is sub -call mind, Protect, and Scald. And it looks really good here in the endgame. The Torn is obviously not very bulky. It's a Life Orb set. The Crook is almost dead. The Cinderace is always in range of Scald at plus one no matter what. Uh, the Mel Metal is going to take a lot. If this thing gets to plus two, it's pretty much dead. The Silvali took 31% from the last Scald, so once again, if this thing gets up to plus two, it has a chance to kill. And the Slowbro should generally never be a threat, as Suicune can typically PP stall it a little bit and get up enough Call Mines. However, we severely overlooked one Slowbro set in prep. Not Call Mind but Imprison, and uh, Imprison is going to shut off not only Scald, but Calm Mind as well. And now Aki is limited to Protect and Sub. Can no longer even attack, and because this thing is burned, it cannot stall out the Slowbro of PP. So this game is, um, it's a wrap. It's over. It ends in a 6-0. I'm going to go hyper fast, and you guys will see after I skip a few turns. Finally, the uh, Suicune decides to uh, switch out into Terrakion, gets off a of Megahorn, goes into Golurk, Dynamic Punches. It, this thing was Resto Chesto as well, so we couldn't even go for Poltergeist with Golurk to knock out the Slowbro, and it just swept. And uh, that was very unfortunate. Uh, a game that was very, very well prepped for generally got beaten by one very hot set. So that's uh, that's us 2-1 down, unfortunately. Not looking too great, but uh, we're hoping we can pull it back with the next one. We got a pretty good battler on the cards. And that is our boy, Matty Brolic. And this is Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, meaning that Z moves are available. Our Z move is Supersonic Sky Strike on Tornadus. And there's is either Coco or Hydro. We're not sure yet. In Mox, we realized how big of a threat Duosion was, so we ended up bringing Guzzlord specifically for it. 
Maddie has the sickest sets this game though. Like absolutely ridiculous sets and you guys are about to see them. So let's get the game started. Maddie is going to open up with Rotom against the Duosion and he's going to go for a Volt Switch into Swampert, follows it up with a Will-O-Wisp, pretty much hits everything, doesn't really matter, and he burns the Ferrothorn, which is huge, because I thought that Ferrothorn was actually a really good offensive threat this game. I actually brought it Choice Banded, because Maddie's only switch into a Choice Banded Gyro Ball is Rotom, <laughs> so Nido King switches in on the rocks, as it's now going to get up rocks, as it threatens a Flamethrower KO on the Ferrothorn, and now the Rotom switches in, on Swampert coming back in and now Maddie is going to make the play of going for Hydro Pump as it's an easy to hit KO on the Swampert and it doesn't have great options to hit the Rotom. Gets the Hydro Pump off but on the Ferrothorn and it's still pretty healthy and is now going to Volt Switch to chip it even further. An extra 9% brings in Sceptile on a Gyro Ball and takes a nice amount of damage, 34%. Uh, but is now going to go for a Focus Blast. Unfortunately, it misses the Duosion which doesn't allow us to sort of scout its set. But it's fine because we're just going to switch into Guzzlord. But uh, Mukamara makes a nice double here into Tapu Koko, forcing out the Guzzlord on a potential Dazzling Gleam. And Maddie bites and goes Nido King on him Power Ice. So Nido King's pretty low, 35%. Probably won't be doing much more this game, right? So. Hidden Power Ice comes out again into Rotom, and Maddie makes the play back into Nido King on Electrium Z, Gigavolt Havoc, and it does nothing. So, wasted Z move. Great play there. Now, keys are going to come out. Maddie goes for the Hidden Power, and Eject Button gets us back into Nido King that is Mago Berry, <laughs> and it gets back a ton of health. So, now the Coco's forced out, goes for U turn. It's Poison Point Nido King because it's physical with Earthquake and Mega Horn to knock out Duosion. Sick set. I love this thing. It was it was so surprising in our mock, and it, it really it really does a lot of work here. So great prep from Maddie, bringing a physical Nido King here with Poison Point. As now Guzzlord's going to switch in on the Pelipper, goes for a U-turn, crits, uh, gets us to 53%, which is kind of unfortunate because now I believe that puts it in range of Swampert guaranteed with Super Power. So. Down goes the Guzzlord, but it's okay because the Duosion's already gone. We didn't really need this thing. Now, uh, Maddie's going to make the play back into Rotom. Going to go for another Hydro Pump into the Ferrothorn. It is not a two-hit KO because the Ferrothorn still has leftovers, so it's nullifying burn. And uh, Maddie's going to go for another Hydro Pump as Ferrothorn actually misses Power Whip. Now, this didn't matter uh, unless it crit because, uh, as you guys will see in a couple of seconds, the Rotom uh, is very tanky, can easily take a Power Whip. In fact, Maddie goes for Rest with a Chesto Berry, uh, brings Rotom back up to full, and Power Whip crits and hits for 48, so he would have needed a very high roll crit uh, to KO. This Ferrothorn would have needed to uh, to really hit the uh, the nuts on that turn that it missed. So now the, uh, <laughs> the Coco is going to come in and crit once again, uh, with the um, the Dazzling Gleam. I don't agree with going Coco here because Coco looks so good in the endgame and if it doesn't KO with Dazzling Gleam, it's dead and gone. So, not sure how I felt about that. I think that Hydra might have been a better play because Rotom can't really touch it. So, not sure I agree with that one, but it's fine. Coco got the KO with the crit. It's all good. It's taken poison damage. It's taken rocks damage and we know it's Electrium, so it's not faster than Sceptile. Sceptile comes in, goes for Leaf Storm, does a ton to the High Dragon and is now going to switch out into Tornadus, expecting this to be Scarfed, and uh, it kind of looks like it is based on the U-turn. Pelipper now comes in on Tornadus, which is interesting because we can just Hurricane, but Maddie decides in case this thing is like absolute max spadef, we're just going to go for the Sky Strike and knock it out. Also catches the Coco on the switch, uh, and now Swampert comes in. Maddie sacks off the Nido King to bring back in Tornadus, to make sure that it has 76% to live waterfall. It's EV to live waterfall in the rain from Mega Swampert. Also an absolutely sick set. Hydra comes back in and Maddie makes a very questionable play here. This is the only play that I was like, don't do that, man, because <laughs> that can cost us the game. Uh, if this Hydra goes for Earth Power here, we actually have the potential to insta lose to Scarf High Dragon's uh, Dark Pulse in the end game. Sceptile is at 29% after Rocks 28, and uh, Torn's at like 5. So <laughs> we uh, we could have lost right here if Hydra had gone for Earth Power, but it does go for Dark Pulse. Uh, so I, I guess good play. Uh, not sure I would have made that play. Would have probably just sacked Torn, then brought in Keys and gone for the uh, 
Oh, Orgon Sceptile, because if, if it's an Earth Power that comes out, at least you can go back into Torn and just U-turn on the Hydra as it's forced to Earth Power again if it's Scarfed. Um, but, uh, but Maddie decides to, I don't know, preserve Differential. Uh, now sacks the Sceptile to the Coco, which again, I don't necessarily agree with because the combination of Sceptile and uh, Keys means that we can't lose to Dark Pulse or Earth Power, but I guess Torn does that too, so it's fine. Um, and Dazzling Gleam is going to come out, knock out the Coco, and uh, with, with the Poison, of course, from, of course, from the Poison Point from Nido King, again, sick bring. Dark Pulse is going to knock out Torn. Of course, the Hydra is Scarfed, and Klefki comes back in. So long as it doesn't get flinched twice, we knock out with Dazzling Gleam and get rid of the High Dragon, and we go back up to 2-2. Two and two. So Maddie got us back to neutral again. Uh, it's, it's a very back-and-forth week right now. This is... Uh, it's, it's very nerve-wracking because every single game counts, and it counts a lot. So let's actually check out the next game. So the next game is Harris against uh, Jerowin Puff. I hope I'm saying that right, by the way. I haven't. If, you, if you're watching this, let me know in the comments if I, if I said that wrong. But uh, this one I'm actually going to put on fast because it's a pretty long game. And it pretty much comprises of one player completely controlling the game and the other one kind of just like switching around as best possible and not really making a lot of reads so yeah uh lando against lando we see imprison again from the lando eye preventing knockoff which is very interesting rocks go up vaporeon comes in toxics the bulu which is going to be pretty big throughout the game as now this thing's on a timer melmetal comes in on swords dance threat of uh close combat is there so we're going to switch out into lando to eat the close combat uh, and now we threaten, of course, Sludge Wave, which Harris does go for, uh, onto the Lando Eye here, uh, and it does 11%, which is nothing, goes for knockoff, trade v knockoff, and this Lando is actually, uh, it's, uh, it's itemless, <laughs> so interesting bring. Uh, Defog comes out as, uh, Lando Eye goes for another knockoff on the, uh, Vaporeon. Uh, we get a Scald Burn on the Urshifu uh, Rapid Strike. And that is going to basically neutralize it for the entire game. Uh, we then proceed to Scald the Aegislash, not burn it. But this uh, Vaporeon's quite spadef and is Wish as well. Mel Metal comes in uh, following that. Uh, goes for an Acid Armor. This thing is not uh, Sheer Force, so Earth Power is not going to knock us out. We go for the Double Iron Bash and get rid of the Lando. We're Leftovers as well, so we're getting back health slowly through time. Uh, Cinderace comes in, U-turns, uh, Vaporeon V... Bulu again as Lando comes in again, takes the Horn Leech, eats it up, uh, is left on 3% and can now just uh, sludge wave or do whatever. Uh, and uh, Harris actually makes a nice series of plays here, goes into uh, Latios on the um, on the double as Urshifu comes in. And then for some reason, Jerwin Puff saved the burned Urshifu uh, and took a Shadow Ball with, uh, with the Aegislash, but the grassy terrain from the Bulu is actually allowing the uh, the Aegislash to live quite well. Uh, and now we see Wild Charge Lantern. Uh, Wild Charge into the Moltres, <laughs> which was... Uh, I, I don't I don't know what to say about this. <laughs> I really gotta... I gotta ask somebody, like, what the idea here was with Wild Charge. I, I, I guess, like, Vaporeon's definitely coming spit-f, so you always bring, like, some kind of physical coverage on this. I don't know. Uh, but uh, I believe this Latio suspects it's gonna go for Psyshock. It's gonna knock out the Urshifu with ease. Aegislash is back in, uh, in comes Moltres on Toxic, and, uh, I believe we go for Fiery Wrath here for pretty much free, no, Nasty Plot this time, uh, and, uh, they switch out into Latios on the Wild Charge again, and, uh, I believe another Shadow Ball comes out here, only does 22% to the Lantern, so I think it's actually Assault Vest because we're Specs, uh, Vaporeon switches in on the Cinderace as, uh, Bulu comes in, and uh, now I think we just go Whimsicott. Yeah, we, we preserve the Lando for a later Intimidate drop on either one of the Bulu or the uh, Cinderace, which is a great play. Uh, Moonblast comes out here into the Aegislash, uh, followed by a U-turn into the Lantern. And Latios comes in and actually knocks this thing out with Psy Shock, which is great. We don't have to deal with Lantern anymore, and we're up a 6-3. to uh, Lando's going to get that Intimidate drop now on the uh, Cinderace as the Vaporeon is at 73 and doesn't really want to switch in on a potential like high jump kick. So uh, Fiery Wrath is now free though on the uh, on the Aegislash every time it's in. Um, Cinderace goes for the Pyro Ball followed by the U-turn. I think high jump kick would have killed there. 
Uh, it's probably a roll, but either way, uh, Vaporeon is going to now protect, I believe, on the uh, Bulu as Stone Edge comes out, predicting either Whimsicott or the Moltres. And uh, now it's it's pretty clinical. We just go Whimsicott on the Bulu every time. We U-turn every time as that thing's on a timer. Bring in Moltres, Fiery Wrath again. And uh, this time, uh, Jaron Puff's going to make... Uh, pretty obvious but nice series of plays regardless goes for the king shield on the air slash prediction on the bulu then goes bulu on the fiery wrath predicting the age slash to stay in so quite nice moltres goes down but now latios is back in with a free shadow ball uh neither pokemon can switch in they'll both die vaporeon comes back in pretty much heals up um mel metal with the use of grassy terrain on the predicted toxic from the age of slash vaporeon comes back in on the shadow ball eats it with ease even though it's a crit uh goes for a wish here knowing that the uh age of slash has to revert back into shield form to not take a massive hit uh and then goes for the protect on the shadow ball so that it can get up another wish here uh on the age of slash and now switches into mel metal as the cinderace doubles in uh but cinderace is not strong enough to knock out mel metal in one in fact it doesn't even two hit ko and earthquake is an easy kill on the cinderace and mel metal also lives shadow ball and proceeds to earthquake the blade form age of slash and knock it out in one so very well played by harris uh love this game it was clinical it was probably one of the cleanest games uh, that anybody had all week and we are now up three two so that's super good and now we just need to win one more game and the next game is gypsy kings so awesome gypsy one of the best draft league players of all time if not the best uh highly regarded and is playing in omega ruby and alpha sapphire probably the format that gypsy is most accustomed to it's the one that's been around the longest of course so let's check out gypsy's game now unfortunately not only is gypsy up against draw 15 who is in my opinion their strongest player on top of that this matchup is abysmal <laughs> it's horrible uh, we reviewed it all week. Zazo talked with me about it and said that Gypsy's matchup was 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 terrible. I suggested a specific set. Nobody listened to me. It could have been really cool here, but was, you know what? That's a, a conversation for another another day. But Gypsy still has chances here. He's still got good sets going on. Uh, got a Rindo Keldeo over here. Got a Trick Room Uniclus, which is looking super threatening if we can get rid of the Dusclops because, of course, Taunt, Paint Split, all that jazz. Uh, very annoying and uh, we've got the triple layers of spikes with no defogger on the other side because this is Oras and Rotom don't get defog so there's there's like zero hazard removal here uh, we uh, we triple s s uh, spike stack and get up rocks with Aerodactyl and everything is taking between like 25 to well actually technically 12 because Rotom's off the ground uh, but most Pokemon are taking 25 Rotom takes 12 from the rocks everything else takes between 6 and 12 from the uh, the rocks as well so get up a bunch of hazards everything's looking a-okay we get up a trick room a couple of times and getting Keldeo to opportune moments we can very easily win this game so Gypsy is going to open up with Klefki knowing that he wants to get up triple layers of spikes draw is going to volt switch on the Klefki and trigger red card into superior unfortunately uh the uh, the Volt Switch crit, I don't know how much it mattered. It probably matters right here because Gypsy could have gotten off another attack here. I'm not sure if Gypsy was carrying Thunder Wave, but it could have been very clutch here for the Serp. Uh, anyway, Unaware Clef comes in on another Leaf Storm. And uh, unfortunately, we are red card again. And we red card the Serp out into the Rotom. Probably the worst case scenario because the Rotom is Mystic Water Modest and does 47% to our specially defensive Clefable. Proceeds to Thunderbolt and Moonlight can only recover so much. And draw even Thunderbolt apparas us on this turn. And uh, now the Moonlight does bring us back up to full, but this Mystic Water Hydro Pump is just doing way too much. 49% is ridiculous. Uh, we get a special attack drop, but it doesn't matter because we're unaware. And Hydro Pump is going to proceed to do 50%. Moonlight recovers it all. And right here, I had suggested actually switching out into Ryudoclus because it is quite specially defensive. Or even Rotom of our own, knowing that the, uh, the Rotom is likely to click um, Hydro Pump. Although it did click Thunderbolt, I believe, here this turn. And uh, Reuniclus would have been a decent switch in, of course. We could have just recovered off a following hit and then gotten up a Trick Room. Left Clef alive for Serp later in the game. But we get a Hydro Pump crit. 
And uh, this kind of matters because if Gypsy decided just, okay, I'm going to Moonlight one more time. And uh, if he hits another Hydro Pump, he hits one. And maybe I'm going to switch out into Reuniclus on the following turn. But because of the crit, we don't even get that luxury. So Clef goes down and now this Superior is looking super scary because it's uh, like, th there's no chance it's not Scarfed, right? Like, look at the team. Look at the team we brought. Other than Klefki, there are no grass resists. It just it just destroys. So Renoclus is going to come out. Pain Split's going to come out from the Rotom. Get back pretty much all its health as Trick Room follows up. And a Jirachi switches in on Shadow Ball. Uh, so this is a good play from Gypsy because the following Psychic is completely free. Even the four times resist will not save you, Jirachi. And uh, now the Dust Clops comes in. And uh, this thing is going to be a nuisance. As we're going to go for a Shadow Ball, but it only does 43, and Pain Split puts it back out of range. And uh, Gypsy's going to recover and uh, get hit with a Taunt on the following turn as he attempts to Trick Room again. Aerodactyl's now going to come in as the uh, the Dusclops proceeds to Nightshade, and we go for Stealth Rocks. And uh, another Nightshade comes out, and now Gypsy's forced out into Rotom because he wants to keep the arrow alive for the potential of hitting uh, Heracross and Revenge Killing Garchomp potentially. Nightshade is going to reduce Rotom to uh, 34%. Expertly EV'd lets this live with 1 HP and is able to get off a hidden power, actually. Because now what Gypsy wants to do is go into Keldeo and uh, go for a taunt. However, Draw does not fall for the taunt and goes for another Nightshade. So, I just want to clarify here. If Gypsy had gone for Calm Mind on this turn specifically... Um, there was a chance that we could have just ran away with this game. Because if we kill Rotom with the plus one secret sword, and Heracross gets rolled by Scald, and Garchomp gets rolled by Scald, uh, the Serp cannot kill us because we're Rindo. So, Calm Mind might have been the play here, but I understand Taunt because Taunt... On the pain split allows you to calm mine twice if this thing stays in like the entire time, and that would guarantee the win. Because Scald into Garchomp, Scald into Heracross, and Secret Sword into the Rotom, I believe, kills every single one. So, because the Rotom is, is modest, max special attack, Mystic Water. Now, uh, Gypsy is going to make the play into Reuniclus and uh, is going to recover here, I believe. No, goes for the Trick Room, and uh, now the Rotom comes in, goes for the Recover. And my man draw does not miss moves. Uh, after this Thunderbolt, I believe they go for another Hydro Pump and hit again. Uh, every Hydro Pump has connected. That's 5 out of 5. Uh, this Reuniclus is now going to go for a Psychic this turn. And uh, Psychic again on the following turn on the Garchomp. We, we, de we debated this turn uh, quite a bit in call. Uh, I suggested uh, possibly going Aerodactyl. Uh, leaving the Reuniclus alive to maybe dodge a Hydro Pump and get up one more Trick Room. Um, and, like, that was that seemed to be our only win condition. Uh, I guess Recover was also an option there, except if uh, if this thing goes for Swords Dance, then it's, a, it's sort of a 50-50, and we'd have to pick a Sack regardless on Outrage. So, it's tough. But uh, now Heracross comes in, and it's got a free kill. It goes for Pin Missile, which I think is a misplay, because uh, just going for... Bullet Seed here is an easy KO, and it doesn't, well, Pin Missile doesn't miss either, but at least it's not resisted by Keldeo. So, uh, Pin Missile comes out, does 38% on each hit to Reuniclus, this thing is gone. Uh, Mega Arrow comes in to Revenge the Heracross, not sure if the crit mattered, I don't think it did, it's a Mega Aerodactyl. Uh, Tough Claws boosted Aerial Ace, now the Rotom comes in on Dragon Claw, 43%, uh, Thunderbolt knocks us out, and now... Basically, we have to bank on the Serp like being some whack Scarf set that doesn't have Giga Drain. Because if it's Giga Drain, it lives Secret Sword 100%. And uh, basically, we, we just lose. But the Serp comes in, takes a bunch of damage, and goes for Giga Drain. So, yeah, that's the clip from the beginning of the video. We don't kill the Serp, and the next Giga Drain knocks us out. So, this means that Mount Rushmore... And the Florida men are tied 3-3. And guess who's playing the last game? Yours truly. I had a lot of pressure on me. Uh, I was playing literally 15 minutes after Gypsy's game concluded. And uh, I, had to, I had to walk around a little bit. I had to, to 
look back at my mocks. I really had to analyze our matchup again. This, this is a game uh, that at first I thought was horrible for me. There, there's like, there's a couple of mons that I could not deal with at the beginning. And Zazo made a team, sent it to me. I'm like, I don't know how I feel about this one, dude. But but it does it does look better actually. I, I kind of like it better than anything we've done so far. And I tested it out in a few mocks. And we made one final adjustment to the team. And then we threw it into the game. And we, we, we were so confident at this point that it was going to work. And we just went for it. So I'm the last game. And I have to clutch up the week for us. <sighs> so let's see what happens. Here we go, boys. Aster J. 2017 retired he's washed who the hell is this guy does anybody even know who this guy is question mark question mark question mark i got a question mark reacts when i got auctioned for in this uh in this tournament league whatever you want to call it um that didn't feel good you know that 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 just made me really want to like prove to everybody that they were they were really dumb so, we have this team here. Uh, it's an Ultra Sun, Ultra Moon team. And, uh, funnily enough, I have only used two of the Pokemon on this team ever in Draft League in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, being Quillfish and Thunderous. The rest of the team, these Mons I have never touched. Um, Steelix, maybe, but I, no, no, not even, no. Uh, and the rest are completely new to me. Surprisingly, I never myself drafted Mega Gallade because I always thought it was an amazing Mon, but I never knew what to do with it. And what to draft around it. So I just avoided it like the plague. Uh, on the other team, Derek, who Zazo was hyping up to be their best player on their team the whole week. Making me feel like I had no shot. Uh, he's got a Kartana and a Tornadus. And they're both Z. And Kartana can run Timid. It can run Adamant Band. It can run Adamant Scarf. It can run those three sets. We gotta check all three. And Torn can fire off its Z-move at a moment's notice. And we gotta check that. And there's a D-Dance T-Tar on the other side. And we gotta check that. And um, the rest of the team, it's 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 there to, to wall up, right? Slowbro, Nidoqueen, and Clefairy. Yeah, they're there as like walls, essentially. And um, there was a Raichu in the back. There was a uh, another Mon that's just completely slipping my mind right now. But... Yeah, we, uh, we saw pretty much every Mon in Mox, and every Mon brought a different level of, uh, of dynamicism, if that's a word, to this team, and it was very hard to check everything, but Zazo, Zazo gave me the lead of leads, gave me a Crocodile, and he said, you're leading with this Crook. I don't care what you say, you are leading with this Crook. There's a Slowbro, there's a Mega Titar, there's a Tornadus, there's a Kartana, it doesn't matter. We're leading Crook. <laughs> All right, Zazo, look, I'm going to listen to you. Um, we'll come up with a game plan for what we do on every single situation with Crook as a lead. And uh, Crook as a lead against Nidoqueen. We click rocks. Screw Earthquake, we click rocks. We just get them up. It's cool. Rocks go up. Tornadus comes in. Zazo said, said to me, once, if, if your opponent leads with Tornadus, you click Stone Edge. Okay, sure, yeah. Uh, knock off my Ayapapa Berry, which I had there specifically because I eat two Hurricanes from Max Special Attack Tornadus. Um, and Z Hurricane. And Focus Blast. Z Focus Blast? Eh, that could do it, maybe. Um, yeah. We get our Ayapapa Berry knocked off, and we Stone Edge, and we get a crit. We knock out the Tornadus, and this Tornadus is the only Defogger. Cart can run it. It's not going to run it in this matchup. Torn is the only Defogger. So, that's gone. And uh, we made sure, we made sure that uh, this Torn would be gone. We, we wanted the Torn to be gone. Because now, now the, the big threat comes in. The big, big cart. Oh, no. 
This is uh, this is bad. We have no grass resist, guys. We have zero grass resist on this team. It's like we got we got like a licky licky and a mess bird in the back. It's really bad. Our grass resist is thunderous. It, actually, our grass resist is a uh, is a combination of mons. It's not just one mon. It's multiple mons. Quillfish coming in and intimidating on the leaf blade, taking 35%. Uh, threatening hidden power fire, and uh, actually just going for a spike because we don't care. Because now there's no there's no defogger. Right? So we get up a spike as T-Tar comes in. And I'm like, uh, okay, cool. Uh, you know what did its job already? Crook. Uh, kind of got rid of uh, Torn pretty easily. So we're going to switch in uh, Crook on the T-Tar. And we're, we're just going to go for Earthquake as Slowbro comes in. And uh, has to eat an Earthquake with sand damage. So this is great. And uh, now we can just go Tapu Fini, get up the terrain, eat a Scald or whatever the Slowbro wants to go for. It's got to be regen because this is a matchup with a Mega Gallade. So I'm not worried about Oblivious on Taunt or anything like that. Uh, and we do have Taunt. And uh, we're actually just going to Moonblast this turn because it does have the potential to knock out the Slowbro. Also gets off damage on the T-Tar if that wants to switch in. And uh, would hit the cart pretty hard as well. So we're just going to Moonblast. We hit the Clefairy. And uh, now we are going to taunt to make sure that it cannot recover. Seismic Toss comes out. Does a lot. 29%. Okay. Uh, we're going to go for Nature's Madness. And Clefairy is going to go for another Seismic Toss. I'm not Leftovers because I'm Aya Papa Berry. Now these berries are sick, man. Give you 50% health back in an instant. You're never going to get back 50% through Leftovers in a game this quick. These berries are crazy. So, we're just going to go for two Moon Blasts here. Clefairy is easily knocked out. It's at 16%. Everything on my team knocks this out at 16%. Moon Blast is going to come out, deal another 16. Goodbye, Clefairy. Kartana comes back in. Uh, we still have no Grass Resist, but we do. We do. We, we have Quillfish. We have Quillfish coming in on a Leaf Blade. And uh, takes 39% this time. That is definitely Adamant Scarf. It's not banned. Banned would do upwards of like 52%. Uh, after the Intimidate, so it's definitely Scarf, it's definitely Adamant, it doesn't have to be Scarf, but like, why would you run anything else with Adamant in this game when there's a Mega Gallade, right? So, I'm gonna switch out Quillfish and conserve it as a sack, and we bring in our second Grass Resist, look at that, it's a Steelix, guess how much Steelix takes from Adamant, Choice, Scarf, Cartana, once it's at minus one, it takes a, a nice little 16-17% uh, and uh, deals Rocky Helmet damage. And now this Kartana is in range of uh, literally blowing on it um, after it comes back in on hazards. It's a 26%. It can't even hit into either of my helmets. Slowbro is going to switch in. I know it's switching in. I'm clicking Toxic, bro. This, this Slowbro is getting poisoned. It's, it's, it's done for the game. You're, you're not keeping the Slowbro anymore. It's not checking my Gallade. No, 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 no. Uh, Slowbro goes for Future Sight. I'm like, okay, cool. I'll go into my Dark type. Uh, I know you don't kill me with Scald, so I'm just gonna cl click Earthquake. Even if you burn me, you're dead to Toxic, and nothing on my team gets hit by the Future Sight following that. And, uh, T-Tar comes in, and, uh, goes for, I believe, Surf after I Earthquake and leave it at 7%. Yeah, it knocks out my Crook, which, uh, I don't really care because I was sacking it anyway, and, uh, better it be to T-Tar than to the Kartana. Cartana came in, I was going Steelix anyway, because there's no re way to remove hazards, and Cartana, even if it doubles out to just to let my Steelix take the Future Sight into, like, Nido Queen's Earth Power, what the hell do I care, right? So, Crook goes down, and, uh, Gallade comes in now, and, oh boy, it's a lot of fighting and Psychic Weeks I see on the other side, so, uh, we're gonna go for Drain Punch here, knock out T-Tar, be brought back up to, uh, 93%. Needle Queen comes in. I'm fully expecting Piapa. Assault Vest was something I saw too. Nah, it's got to be Piapa. And uh, Zen Headbutt comes out. Piapa Berry triggers 46%. Shadow Ball comes out. Does a measly 51%. As long as I hit another Zen Headbutt, I'm good. Even if I don't hit Zen Headbutt, look who's sitting in the back. Untouched the whole game. Thunderous. Thunderous just comes in. Just, like, Cartana, what are you going to do? You got to hit into my Steelix. You're done. Just go for Zen Headbutt. And we got to preserve. We got to preserve the 4-0, right? We are... Wait for it. Shadow Sneak. And Cartana goes down. Now let me just say, I pounded my chest, I think, uh, like 16, 17 times after this game. Rush more, bro. 
I am on the best team. How did you guys let me go? Let's let's real talk for a second, okay? How the fuck did y'all let me go for 5.5k in this auction? Please, please, just. I am going to make your lives a living hell from here on out. I promise you that we will destroy you. You will regret having wasted two months of your time letting me go for 5.5k. Yeah. All right. We'll see how that ends. Anyway, guys, that was uh, DPL week one. And uh, be looking forward to much, much more to come. I'm actually not playing in week two. I'm benched. Obviously, I didn't do well enough. Nah, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> we put in a lot of work this week. We uh, we did a lot uh, in this first week to, uh, to get this win. And... <laughs> Thank God I put in as much work as I did. Otherwise, this this matchup would have shocked. We would have fallen by the wayside. And it looks simple, right? The way that I executed it, it looks really simple. But a lot of work went into this. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a little exhausted. I'm not going to lie. I've been sitting here for like God knows how long trying to, uh, to record this video. I've recorded one before. This is like three hours of recording at this point. This video is probably going to come out to about like, I don't know, 40 minutes or so. So... Just, yeah, guys, uh, I'm, I'm going to take a break for this week, uh, week two, but I will still be reviewing everybody's matches. So uh, I'm going to put in as much work as I can to help out everybody and mock everybody. I've been focusing on uh, a couple of other personal things and uh, and getting this video done as well. But starting uh, tomorrow from the point that this is recorded, I will be putting in the work to help every single one of us and make sure that once again, we make the next team's life a living hell. Thank you for watching, and I will see you guys on the next one. Peace.